Anybody can they please switch off their mobile phones so they don't interfere with the sound system and not interfere with the broadcasting of the meeting. Um, a new Kadala in in Strategy Call uh the Heritage Council Strategy 2018-2022. Um, so today we'll discuss with the officials from the Heritage Council uh, and from the local Authority Heritage Officer Network regarding the Heritage Council. So we're going to suspend now so that we can allow the witnesses to come in to start the meeting again. Um, uh, Michael Starrett, uh, Chief Executive, August Miss Marie Burke, Heritage Council Board Member, and Mrs Helena O'Keefe, August O, uh, Local Authority Heritage Office Next Work, uh, Miss she Sheila uh, Clerken, August Coma, Dr Joseph Callagher. Um, Solid us um Mauriam Dana Dini Tosa Kor, Amrocha Kaime Shohaleva Mak Nur Hagan Aimden Os Kor, Koshta, Kundanif Kinta Kadigan Sheet Relika and Koshta. So before I ask you to address the meeting, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you conti continue continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. Uh, you are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to, that, to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. I also wish to advise you that the opening statement um, and any other documents you have submitted to the committee may be published on the committee website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Um, con to commence our discussions, uh, Ira Mortanish, uh, on May the Hallerag at the court in our law. Please hang. 
My thanks uh, to the Chairman and members for the invitation to make the presentation. It's always a, a, a pleasure and a privilege to come back and, and speak on behalf of the Heritage Council. Um, Dr Murray Burke, as you've said, Heritage Council member since uh, 2016 and member of the Council's strategy group, which developed the strategy document that we'll uh, be discussing with members, joins me as does Dr Helene O'Keefe, the Heritage Council's Head of Education and Communication. I have to say, Chairman, that the, the timing of the presentation uh, on the Council's new chat strategy is actually it's very, very appropriate. It comes almost exactly 12 uh, months uh, after the Chairman of the Heritage Council, Michael Parsons, appeared before your committee uh, prior to his confirmation as Chairman. And on that occasion, the Chairman outlined his vision for the future of the organisation, uh, and this strategy is now the logical progression of that. His uh, vision was seen through his own community-based experiences, particularly his commitment to education uh, at a national level as an active member of the National Association of Principals and Deputy Principals. I think it's also very pertinent at this point uh, to be very clear with members that the choice of the, the moniker, the, the name of the, our new strategy, Heritage at the Heart, is very, very significant. The, the Chairman of the Council, in his opening remarks uh, to the strategy, emphasises that the Heritage Council's strategic vision uh, is to see heritage at the heart of Irish society. And I'll come to the definition of heritage so that you will understand where the Council is coming from that. It's important also that the committee is aware that in working to secure its vision uh, that the Chairman of the Council also acknowledged the role of the many partners with which the Council works, partners particularly but not exclusively I have to say within the heritage community. Council as you'll be aware is but one small agency within that community so such a partnership approach is not only desirable but it's essential if we are to actually carry out our responsibilities under the Heritage Act. Certainly in the context of partnership, I'm absolutely delighted that you'll also hear today from the chairperson of the Local Authority Heritage Officer Network. Uh, the local authorities have always been identified as the key partners for the Council as a small agency reaching out to communities. Uh, and the partnership between the Heritage Council and local authorities that has led now to 28 of the local authorities employing heritage officers can be considered a jewel in the crown of everything that the Heritage Council has achieved in the 20 short years since it was established. Other initiatives such as the Museum Standards Programme and the National Biodiversity Pro uh, Data Centre are built on policy proposals uh, developed by the Council. And it has to be said, and I hope the members are fully appreciative of this, that those have become essential parts of what is now a national heritage infrastructure. It's there for the people of Ireland, it serves the people of Ireland, and it assures the quality and excellence in both your decision making, our policy proposal, and also the use of that information as an educational tool. As legislators, I don't have to remind you that all of our work uh, is derived from the Heritage Act, which establishes the Heritage Council as a body corporate. The Council has 11 members, represented here today by uh, Mary Burke. And a key function of the Council under that Act is to propose policies and priorities for the identification, protection, preservation and enhancement of the national heritage. Members of the committee are asked to note, and I emphasise, that the Heritage Council therefore enjoys responsibility for both natural and cultural heritage. Uh, all its work seeks to integrate the relationship between people and place between nature and culture. And as amended by the 2018 Act, which took a long time to get there, I have to say, but uh, uh, now the Heritage Act is amended, the Council has a particular responsibility, which I again want to emphasise for this committee, and that is to cooperate with, engage with, advise and support public authorities, local communities and persons in relation to the functions of Council. <coughs> I ask you to note particularly the specific reference there to local communities, because this reference to local communities was one of the key and substantive amendments to the Heritage Act in 2018. No such specific reference to our work with communities was included in the 95 Act, and the change reflects the fact that without the support of the communities that you are elected to serve, then us carrying out our task would not be possible. 
Members of the committee are also asked to note, and specifically in the, the uh, more detailed presentation, the function of Council re-coordinating all activities relating to the functions of the Council. This it has to be said, has allowed Council to collaborate and, I have to say, influence key land use interests such as agriculture and forestry, and I can expand on that as appropriate, but more particularly in recent years, uh, educational and other interests uh, such as community development, rural development. The Heritage Council, also from a legislative point of view, you need to bear in mind, has specific responsibilities in relating to the Planning Act, under the Heritage Fund Act, as, as a member of the Council of National Cultural Institutions, and Section 103 of the Finance Act, in terms of the uh, uh, donation of heritage objects to the state. In meeting our statutory obligations, and translating those into effective actions through implementation of our strategic plan, I want to pay particular attention to why heritage matters, not to the Heritage Council, not necessarily to you, but to people, all of us. Heritage, it has to be said, is the foundation of our culture, and it has been described as the, the steady pulse of contemporary Ireland, and here I emphasise contemporary Ireland. It encompasses not just buildings, monuments and museum pieces, but as highlighted in the legislation, our act, it includes our distinctive landscapes, our native wildlife, and we made an earlier presentation just about 12 months ago on the natural heritage side of things, woodlands, as well as literature, folklore and crafts. And of course, all of this is passed on from previous generations. It defines who we are in the present and our efforts to understand our heritage, protected and interpreted, will be our legacy for future generations, and uh, dare I be so presumptive as to say your legacy as well. Whether tangible or intangible, personal or collective, heritage is therefore at the absolute heart of our society. Its relevance is palpable at a local level, and again we can expand on this in the questions and answers, but heritage drives economies. You think of the tourism and the agriculture sectors, the quality of our heritage determines the quality of those industries. It stimulates innovation. Just look at the information uh, in terms of the art that is in the, the entrance to these committee rooms that has inspired artists in terms of their, their interpretation of landscapes and, of course, our craft workers. Our craft workers and our designers at a local level all seek inspiration from the places where they live. It also acts as a focal point for festivals and commemorations. And again, this is something that we can talk about in much more detail. Uh, Helen, in particular, in terms of Heritage Week, and Mari, uh, in terms of the cultural sector, the European Year of Cultural Heritage, as members choose. Heritage, therefore, is undoubtedly then German, a touchstone of identity. It fosters a sense of belonging, and it supports, very importantly, social cohesion at a local and a national level. It simultaneously crosses borders, transcends differences to connect people through sharing values, history and indeed traditions. In terms of our own specific plan, we identify three particular <coughs> specific objectives. To advance national heritage priorities, to nurture belonging and to ensure a vibrant heritage sector. To advance national heritage pro uh, priorities, it, it's important to note that international policy makers particularly within the EU, are becoming increasingly aware of the potential of heritage to contribute to economic growth, and I use the term social cohesion again, as well as to national pride and to well-being. All our actions in terms of the implementation of this plan will emphasise that. As regards nurturing belonging, it has to be said that in a world of increasing globalisation, multiculturalism and mobility, we tend to lose sight of the local. And heritage inspires that sense of belonging to both geographic and thematic communities. Heritage lies at the root of our individual and our collective identities and is also the seed from which new, and very importantly, new connections can grow. Certainly, the Council sees its strategy as a blueprint for increasing inclusivity. It addresses the inextricable links between heritage, identity, people and place, and the absolute imperative of engaging with both the diaspora and our community-based custodians of this heritage. To ensure a vibrant heritage sector, 
The Heritage Council, I'd like to think, has always taken an innovative approach in enabling communities to care for and enjoy their local heritage. Through our grant schemes, much curtailed as uh, funding has decreased, through dynamic heritage networks such as the Heritage Officer Network or the Irish Walled Towns Network, or indeed I refer to the network of the Museum Standards uh, Programme, but also new networks such as that for the Irish Uplands Partnership. We look to provide impetus, small levels of support for community engagement and the development of heritage awareness and participation. There's a strong commitment in this plan, as I touched on at the beginning, to educational and research programmes because we need the policies that we propose to the uh, members of the Dáil uh, through our department. There's a strong commitment to education and research to stimulate curiosity and promote the highest levels of understanding and appreciation. The plan itself doesn't touch on probably the most significant fourth element. Uh, one could say that's a strategic decision. Uh, I'll leave that to you to decide on that. That fourth element requires emphasis and that is that in this changing world of compliance and governance, we need to ensure that the Heritage Council is eff effective in its administration, its financial management, and has the governance capacity to allow the organisation to operate effectively and develop Irish heritage. The Chairman of the Council also addresses this, um, this imperative in, his, in this plan by stating that the Heritage Council is aware of the constraints of its current capacity and will continue to be imaginative and innovative in the way it secures and directs its resources. It's pleasing to note in many government and uh, political uh, manifestos and proposals that, that uh, the prominence accorded to heritage in recent government policies and initiatives such as Culture 25, Creative Ireland, the National Landscape Strategy, the Biodiversity Plan, the National Development Plan, Project Ireland 2040 and the Action Plan for Rural Development. And of course the commitment by Minister Madigan to publish a new National Heritage Plan in the next 12 months will add further impetus to our work critical to achieving the Heritage Council's vision for 2018 is the continued support and development of the dynamic and diverse heritage sector. Heritage can play a key role in helping to resolve complex and changing socio-economic issues and this plan seeks to address those contemporary issues such as the current housing crisis. Heritage can help in motivating heritage-led regeneration of some of Ireland's cities, their towns and the village centres. Working with others to facilitate the reuse of existing buildings can help to alleviate aspects of the crisis that we're currently in. And there have been great strides made in that uh, way through the rural development and the village programmes, but more needs to be done. In a similar way, new initiatives that focus on native woodlands, acknowledging the uh, value of high nature and less extensive forms of agriculture, and the development of the Council's a series of uplands partnerships, can help in alleviating contemporary issues surrounding climate change and rural decline that is associated with that. To be effective, therefore, the Council needs, I have to say without equivocation, needs to enhance its capacity both in terms of its overall staff, its revenue funding and its capital funding to make that available to the public that it serves. Discussions are ongoing with the Department of Culture, Heritage and Gaeltacht and our partnership with them is well established to try to ensure that increase in capacity to allow the effective implementation of this plan. To conclude, uh, Chairman, I'd just like to say that the Heritage Council for its part uh, very much welcomes the recent launch by Minister Madigan of the public consultation to Heritage Ireland. It has to be said uh, that uh, Heritage has always been uh, and received and the Heritage Council has always worked and received cross-party support. And setting a vision for Heritage for 2030 is going to transcend governments and that I think is a very important point to make. There is a commitment in this uh, uh, consultation document to a revitalised and refreshed National Heritage Plan, something which I know the local authority heritage officers and the uh, chief executives really welcome as a framework within which they can allocate their funding. In her foreword, Minister Madigan, and I make no apology for quoting it, state that Heritage 2030 will bring together a tapestry of other relevant heritage initiatives. It will provide an overarching space for engagement and action over the next decade. I particularly like the word action. 
It will integrate essential national heritage policy principles into the future strategies of the entire government and will be supported by investment under Project Ireland 2040. That is setting out a real vision that I think that we can all uh, work towards trying to secure and achieve. And the Council looks forward to contributing fully and constructively to this process. In the consultation exercise, we will look to ensure that uh, not only are the commitments given, but that the most effective and efficient mechanisms and frameworks are put in place and fully resourced, thus allowing all of the objectives that emerge to be met in the lifetime of the plan. And I have to say, I would encourage all of you, uh, to, with your local communities, to get engaged in that consultation process. Chairman, uh, the challenges are immense for all of us, uh, but the opportunity currently presented needs to be grasped. I thank you. Gora Margaret, um, members, before um, we take questions, we'll ask uh, the network of the heritage officers from the local authorities to present, uh, and then we'll ask questions based on that on, on, on both. So, kind of, uh, can you have your presentation, please? Chair um, Thank you, Chairman and members of this joint committee for inviting the Local Authority Heritage Officer Network to make this presentation today. Um, my name is Shirley Clarkin and I'm the Heritage Officer with Monaghan County Council and Chair of the Local Authority Heritage Officer Network. I'm joined by my Heritage Officer colleague, Dr Joseph Gallagher from Donegal County Council. So heritage is part and parcel of our identity and it's the thatched cottages in Donegal and the special way the thatch is held down with ropes to stop them lifting on a windy day. And it is the Irish damselfly, distinctively apple green on its thorax and only found on a small number of lakes and wetlands. It's our legacy of townland names like the Curragh or Bealaha on Caha, so rich in language and meaning, hiding within them old histories and land use. It is the dawn chorus. You won't hear the same birds in any other country. It is our cultural landscape, dotted with monuments from past societies like Dune Angus or Loch Crew, and indeed large earthworks like the Black Pig's Dyke. Historic buildings like Muckras House, Dublin's Henrietta Street, courthouses and market houses dotted throughout our towns, in their very construction, design and ornamentation, highlight the work of skilled craftspeople and play a vital role in our towns and villages. It is our farming traditions like the Burren Winterage and the upland farming practices which are in sync with their habitats and create high nature value. It is our music, language, instruments, song, sports, stories and folklore so evocative of place and time. And the recent inscription of the Illan Pipes to the International List of Intangible Cultural Heritage of Humanity underlines the uniqueness of Ireland's culture and heritage as an enriching aspect to all humanity. And all tangible and intangible elements weave together to form our heritage and to connect people with it. Heritage is a public good. It belongs to us all and is crucial for identity as a cultural anchor and social stability, especially in times of change, for well-being as it contributes to the maintenance of a healthy environment and ecosystems, for cultural jobs, cultural tourism and jobs, creativity and farming. The best people to conserve and protect our heritage are local communities and they've been doing a stellar, stellar job with limited resources. Enabling and facilitating local communities to achieve this is the main role of the Heritage Officer Programme, which has been in existence for almost 20 years. The recently published European Cultural Heritage Strategy recognises that there is an urgent need to reposition cultural heritage policies, placing them at the heart of an integrated approach, focusing on the conservation, protection and promotion of heritage by society as a whole, by both the national authorities and the communities. Established in 1999, the Local Authority Heritage Officer Programme is one of the Heritage Council cooperative initiatives and allows the Heritage Council to effectively reach local government and communities all over the country. Both parties contribute to the success of the programme. The Heritage Council funds the Heritage Officer Programme at 25% and of the 31 authorities there are currently 25 Heritage Officers in place and a number in recruitment. The Heritage Officer role is a strategic one and must be a core service within a changing local government which has orientated increasingly towards community. 
the Heritage Council provides technical support for the Heritage Officer Programme, which is important as Heritage Officers are by and large standalone heritage professionals in their organisations. We are under a different government department than the local authority itself. We share similar goals and align local heritage plans with the Heritage Council strategic plan. We bring innovative, participatory practices into the heritage sphere, involving communities to de-bureaucratise heritage and once again engage people with it. We are living and working in these communities. We help to create conditions whereby experts can meet with communities to share with each other knowledge about heritage. Advocacy, capacity building and underpinning like this is essential to support government in achieving its own departmental goals, including the National Heritage Plan, National Biodiversity Plan and implementation of other heritage protections and policies. It can be challenging to deliver a heritage agenda when sometimes the importance of the heritage mandate can be overlooked. That can manifest itself in poor planning decisions and failure to recognise and capitalise on heritage-related economic activities and potential. Project Ireland 2040 recognises the importance of heritage and historic town cores and aims to bring historic buildings back into use. This has been supported by the new Historic Towns Initiative, for example in Port Leash, and the Town Centre Health Checks in towns around the country, including Monaghan, organised by the Heritage Council and supported through the Heritage Officers. Successful local heritage management requires a wide definition of heritage, capacity for heritage management, a planned strategic approach, commitment and support, leadership and heritage data. The development and implementation of local heritage plans with the heritage forums contributes to this. We link with the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht through their services, particularly with the National Parks and Wildlife, National Monuments Service and National Inventory of Architectural Heritage. And these relationships are crucial. We, pro we provide data through, through local survey work to them and to the National Biodiversity Data Centre. We also work with Creative Ireland through the local culture teams to embed culture and creativity at the heart of public policy. Recommendations. We welcome the recent announcement of the consultation for the new National Heritage Plan. The absence of recent government policy in this area had created an unhelpful policy vacuum and gap in heritage leadership which we hope can now be remedied. We have 20 years experience building community and local involvement in heritage and are keen to share and work in partnership with the department on the type of actions which could contribute to its objectives. The heritage sector has grown through the heritage officer networks and includes communities and individuals all over the country who are full of enthusiasm, knowledge and commitment. They represent a huge resource if supported to be involved and to contribute to their ideas and vision for heritage. We are ready to assist the department in this process to develop the new national heritage plan and to encourage communities to engage with the consultation process. The Council of Europe has recently found that budgetary and human resources, both at the European level and at the level of some member states, are increasingly inadequate to ensure the conservation and restoration of European heritage, and thus to ensure that it can be transmitted as a legacy to future generations. Despite the increase in the remit, reach and demand for heritage services from the public since the establishment of the Heritage Officer Programme in 1999, Heritage officers, for the most part, still operate as one-person heritage sections. The number of heritage officers has not materially changed since 2008. We believe that there is potential to expand the local heritage services to meet current demands and future ambitions. We recently suggested to the Heritage Council Board that an assistant heritage officer programme be established using a similar model as that to the original heritage officer programme. Heritage practice is more complex than ever before for heritage managers, but a strategic framework of the attributes of a good local heritage service has not been developed in Ireland. An Australasian framework provides a potential model that may prove useful as a basis for such an examination, including a review of the existing barriers to such a service. 
Funding for heritage plan implementation is important for local authorities and there is a need for continued and increased investment in this area, especially as the new National Heritage Plan will seek activity and implementation at a local level. In tandem with this, there is a need to increase community heritage grants through the Heritage Council to allow local communities as heritage, heritage custodians to engage and invest in their heritage so that they can continue to create better places for people to live. Thank you, Chairperson and members of the committee for inviting the Heritage Officers to present our work to you. And I wish to extend an invitation to you on behalf of our network to visit heritage initiatives that have been supported by our programme to see firsthand the contribution heritage is making to our communities and society across the country. Thank you very much. Doing a second more simple nature are er, going uh, in the different the number of that right. um, I'd like now to take the opportunity, as well as thank them both for the contribution, um, and I think surely your definition at the start of what heritage was, I think, captures for me uh, a, a lot of what heritage is. I remember the old saying, it's part of what we are. Well, in fact, it is what we are, whether we like it or not. Um, and sometimes people confuse it or uh, put it on a higher plane than kind of, uh, uh, every, everyday issues. Um, I'm going to ask the members uh, to ask questions, make comments uh, first, and I'll come back in at the, at the end um, if, if they haven't reached. I have a few questions that I'd like to ask myself. Um, I don't know whether... Aon, did you want to ask some? Yeah, did I you were first yeah. here? That's why I'll take oh, you. Great. Yeah, thanks very much. I'll go to Grameen and I'll Father. I'll talk to that. On show, I'll go to Carl O'Hare and Sinu Gajo. Just, just a few uh, thoughts, if I might. I suppose, in in the political sense, it's 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 often kind of a lazy um, analysis to make their culture and heritage the same thing, which and, and they're very, very different. Uh, heritage is, is what came before us, and culture is what what exists uh, now. Um, I might ask just uh, a few things, and I, I thought the first presentation was interesting in, in, in how we can connect heritage with with contemporaneous issues. And you mentioned housing. Um, how do we how do, how do we fight for heritage in terms of its political um, uh, uh, priority? Whenever we go abroad, whenever we put the face of Ireland to the world, heritage icons are put to the fore, uh, the arts, culture is put to the fore, but when we come to budgetary, budgetary measures at home, they're way down the bottom of the list. And I was really taken by uh, the comment you made, Shirley, about um, uh, heritage officers being a, a one-person heritage section uh, in each uh, local authority. I thought that was actually quite, quite, quite a strong uh, comment to make. Um, I know uh, you're about constrained as to how you might answer that question, but I, I'd be interested to, to, to get your, your your response to it. The second point I want to make is, um, I taught for a long time in inner city in Dublin. Their heritage is very different to what was in the textbooks that they were handed as children. Their heritage is, is housing schemes, is, is flat complexes, it's the docks, it's TB. It's 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 a different way of life. I, I think uh, when I was in school, I could tell you every land act from 1870, but I wasn't necessarily as as well versed with the housing schemes that came out of World War One or what happened in uh, in, in, in in tenement Dublin. Um, and I, what I'm trying to ask there is how do we connect heritage with, with every type of community that's in Ireland? Because Ireland is not homogenous. There are different uh, elements to the Irish nation that have a heritage that they need to be uh, connected with fully in order to make it theirs, in order to feel that that is theirs. And the last question I'll ask in terms of addressing, and, and that is in a way how do you, that, that, that's connecting with reaching out to disconnection, to disenfranchisement, to disadvantage, um, making Ireland of, of everybody, if you like, um, that it is theirs. Uh, and again, the last question is, you mentioned housing, and, and I'm, I'm tickled by that, because in Dublin, for example, when we try to um, rejuvenate uh, often listed buildings come up, and there's actually a flat complex in Ballybock, which I'm thinking of right now, which we can't we can't redevelop because it's a listed building. Uh, how do we how do we make that balance? How do we strike that balance between something that is worth saving and worth um, treasuring, 
but there isn't a sense that it's an aloof aspiration to keep something which isn't, you know, isn't solving the needs of the day. Um, so, just to summarise our questions, you'd like, uh, how do you help us help you? Um, how do we make heritage real to every community, um, particularly those who are disenfranchised, disconnected, uh, disadvantaged, and new communities as well? Uh, and, uh, and thirdly, how do we uh, how, how do we help heritage solve uh, solve issues uh, if that can be done? And I'm, I'm asking those questions because you could you made reference to them. Come on, Michael. Michael or the Heritage Council first. Chairman, I, um, I'm not going to answer all the questions. No, you don't have to. <laughs> so, which is fine, but I'll, can, I, can I choose the easy one? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, think, I, the chairman, I, think, I think the Chairman uh, got it right because uh, it's, it's, in many ways, I'll take the one about how, how do you make people connect. Um, the Chairman said it's, it's part of what we are. And whether you're in Ballybock or whether you're in, uh, in a show or what have you, that's the place where you live. That's, that's the, your environment and your surroundings. And that, that's your contemporary environment and your contemporary heritage. And we have many inner city initiatives where we're working with people uh, through uh, educational services or what have you to actually, it's all about improving the quality of those places. Heritage isn't always the answer, but the whole educational and the connection side with people uh, is really where, where you make that connection. And there needs to be, and I, I, it's all very well to have a huge amount of capital investment in, 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 in big projects and what have you, but what we really need to do is invest in people who can actually go out, who can communicate, who can actually encourage, who can support. And I think that's, that's an issue that, that governments are going to have to, to, to wrestle with. Uh, Mary is a great fighter. I, I should refer her to the one about uh, how, how do we fight for heritage? Because in fact, Mary Burke has been fighting for heritage much longer in Ireland than, than I have. And I, I, should I be so presumptuous? Well, thank you, and it's a privilege to be here to speak to all of you. I think probably um, if you were to fight for Irish heritage, you would be fighting for what is your key national asset. So if it's your key national asset, Irish heritage, everything that we are, everything that this nation, sorry, every, this, everything that this nation is in terms of its landscape, in terms of its natural heritage, in terms of its rivers, in terms of its culture, in terms of its monuments, in terms of everything like that, what could be a greater thing to be fighting for? The, the, the main argument is, um, it is absolutely critical to our whole tourism industry. So, for example, I use the analogy quite often in relation to the Museum Standards Programme, uh, which is one of the great unsung uh, success stories of the Heritage Programme, the Heritage Council. It's uh, up and running uh, 10 years, and it has singly raised the standards of Irish museums around the country. But you think of any visitor to this country in autumn, winter, spring, before we get the lovely weather. And where do they go? They're staying in a lovely hotel. They want to go somewhere and they want to do something. And the majority of them, of the Europeans, they want to find out about our heritage. They normally go to a heritage centre, preferably to a local museum. And it's in that museum, they don't necessarily want to find out about uh, connections with Europe. That's just a nice counterproduct of that. They want to know about the local people, what makes them tick, what do they do, how do they live. And that's where something like our local museums are so critical. So they're places for people to go, to connect with local people, to find out about Irish society and to understand us. Now that's just a very small strand of what is our heritage. But if you think of a programme that the uh, Heritage Council has set up with huge consultation and that is raising the standard of all our museums uh, slowly, bit by bit, in conjunction with the Department of Arts, then you have something that is improving the quality of Irish life, and that is part of Irish heritage. So if you look at what the work of the uh, local authority heritage network and the, what the officers are doing, what the uh, right across the country and all the other networks, they are promoting heritage. So if you're fighting for heritage. You're fighting for something that is intrinsic to who we are and what we're going to leave for the future and for our youth, for our young people. 
Okay, Cheryl. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Deputy. I'll take the question on the heritage officer, the one person heritage officer section, and also to say how do we reach out to contemporary issues and contemporary societies. And I think one of the main roles of the heritage officer is to democratise heritage and to try to explain the national legislation and policies that you know that the, um, committees like this um, contribute to and develop at a national level, and to make them very reachable for the ordinary citizen in Ireland and to make them to see to let them see that it's actually very relevant to where they are and where they live and that's very much what we do and we base all our heritage um, work in the local area so it would be very much based on what type of place someone lives in so whether that's vernacular buildings or as you say industrial heritage or an industrial landscape or whatever so that's very much where we come from we try to come from the community in which people are based, not a fantasy community that they, they, they see in textbooks or history books. Um, the heritage officers are, um, were established in 1999 and um, as a very in, an innovative practice from the Heritage Council at the time um, to try to, I suppose, um, um, reach the objectives of the Heritage Council Act, um, which would be very um, unachievable with 14 staff members within the Heritage Council itself, which is the cap on the council numbers through legislation. So that allowed the Heritage Council to push forward with those heritage objectives right into local authorities and into heritage communities. And um, that, so the programme has been running out over the country since then, and there's one local authority per heritage officer, or one heritage officer per local authority, and we haven't expanded since then. But the demand for our services has increased exponentially over the last um, 20 years, and particularly over the last 10 years during the bust, actually, where communities have been re-engaging with their place and sense of place. And there has been a re-engagement with people and each other and to try to use heritage as a new driver for economic activity, trying to use local places and local heritage assets as a drive to move tourism into places that probably hadn't been reached by tourism before and to use an authentic heritage asset that's maybe tour guides from local communities or whatever. So there's been a huge demand for that. And in order for that to be done in an authentic way and um, with the support of local communities so the heritage objects or heritage places aren't being commodified without their um, cooperation. Um, we've been able to work with them to identify what's important about their place, to help them to conserve it, and then to build on that to push it through other tourism assets, so that, that, that their tourism asset can, can become part of Ireland's hidden heartlands or the Irish ancient east or whatever. So that's very important. But as a heritage section ourselves, we work both with communities, we work with road sections sometimes, with planning applications. We also work um, with economic development. Um, within our local authority, we work at the museum services, with the cultural teams, and then we work with all of the local communities and our heritage forum. And the demand for our service has really, really, it's, it's really, it's been at pinch point for the last seven or eight years now. And we feel that there would be there's great opportunity to support communities and to facilitate communities to further develop in this area, particularly when the new National Heritage Plan is going out for consultation at the moment. I think there's a great opportunity for us to punch above our weight in this area, and I think Mary's right on this. It's constantly what we sell as a, as a country. We sell our national Irish heritage, and as you say, it's heterogeneous. It's not a homogenous thing. It's very distinctive, based in local area, and I think we could really do well to support it better. Thank you. Joseph, have you anything to say on, from the Donegal aspect? Uh, well, maybe not specifically on the Donegal aspect, but I suppose just to reiterate uh, some of the points that Shirley made. Um, one of the constant challenges, I suppose, in terms of, of heritage is raising awareness, and I think for all our roles, that's a constant challenge uh, among the communities as well. And I think we've, we've done that successfully, and as Shirley indicated, there is now a demand for the, the heritage services at the local level. And very often it's about supporting those local initiatives, and I think communities want to engage with heritage, and they want to engage with all different aspects of heritage, be it natural, built, or cultural heritage. And locals know their heritage best. So very often it's only about giving them a little bit of direction, advice and support to try and support their initiatives rather than encouraging them to do anything. They, they, they're there, they have the capacity to, to deliver on the heritage agenda, but they need that direction and it's very important that they get that early on. And those heritage initiatives contribute to and are at the heart of the sense of identity and also the, their pride in their place. Margaret, um 
Uh, Senator Murray, Louise O'Donnell. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and uh, you're all very welcome. In fact, you're possibly one of the most relevant group of people who have come in, um, and it's delightful to see you. I had the privilege of covering many of the Heritage Weeks once a year for RT, and everything from moths in um, County Cavan to under the... Uh, the, the black sky with all the sounds of nature out in Ballycroy, and it's really extraordinary. Um, two things. It sounds to me as everything is going swimmingly, from your, and rightly so, that you're extremely positive. Um, but I know the curlews are down, and I know the finches are down, and I know our streams and our rivers are not what they should be, and I know we're way behind in relation to Europe. And when you speak about people, place, nature, and culture, even if you took the whole area of nature, it's so enormous, the whole area of culture is so enormous, place and people. Do you think there is a place for you to be a department yourselves? Now, people run now and they say, oh, no, 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 we're part of culture and we're part of arts. Yes, but that kind of a mothership that we're all under Tesco in another way, that we're all going to shop at Tesco and soon they'll be, soon they'll be sending us to school. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure about that mothership business because you're so powerful yourselves and you delve into so many different areas. Does one of the ways of, um, of becoming even greater at what you do, that you'll be more independent? Like, it fascinates me that you're stuck in the middle of culture and that you're stuck in the middle of it. It doesn't, in one way, I can see the tentacles and the connections, and they're very obvious. But in another way, you don't have the same independence of thought. You're, you're caught, you're caught, well, you're caught with that tentacle and that conduit and that roadmap. Would you not be better for fighting for your own in, uh, heritage, heritage department? I, I would be doing that, I, as well as keeping all the other moments of, of people, place, nature and culture, which come into the arts and into language and into um, everything we do and music and song and everything we do. But I wonder about it because the more I see about the mothership, the more everybody's under this umbrella and you're so important that I, 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 that you're on the end, not on the end of the table, but you're just part of a general table. I mean, because the arts, when you think of music and drama and dance and visual art, and they too demand a department. But I, and at one stage they were with sport, and then another stage they were with tourism, and you use the word sell all the time, I, and I don't like the word sell. We're not selling, we have to learn to be, and it is us, not sell it. You know, we are, and also one of the main points in, in some of your outlines was that you needed extra arts, uh, extra heritage officers. I mean, that is fine, but, uh, but if you want to be or find a place in our psyche, be it educational, cultural, and all those other areas, from the time that we are five to the time we are 55, 95, would you not, should you not be, um, holding out for a more powerful place within a department? Can it's a I, question, I, I, departmental can I, can question. I, can I, I speak first, if yeah, I may? I think so. if and it's an awful pity the Senator O'Reilly didn't wait, because it might have answered his, um, no, his question. Very, it's a very, very valid, valid question, and I have to say that um, the first thing that we fought, we have fought long and hard to ensure that the word heritage is in the departmental name. Um, uh, art is gone now, uh, so does that mean that culture and heritage are different? Someone touched on that earlier. It's an no. amalgamation. Because I mean, culture and heritage are inextricably linked. Now, you asked me a question, would we be better as a, as a, a government department? I'll uh, look at my uh, departmental uh, uh, colleagues over there and say, that is the last thing that heritage needs. Uh, I think that what you need to remember is that the Houses of the Oireachtas uh, established the Heritage Council. They actually give it, uh, under legislation, a degree of autonomy and a degree of independence. It has an independent board. Uh, it has an independent uh, chairman. Um, what is needed is, uh, to go back to the fight, the capacity and the resource that allows it to effectively do the job. It is that not my, sorry, my chair, through the chair. I don't mean that the department would exclude all the brilliant things you've created yourself. I am suggesting that some sort of 
independence would allow you to push forward the very things you're looking for. The fact that you are amalgamated within culture, arts, like, it, it, I, I, I would suggest it somehow closes you down insofar as that there is a pecking order. There, there is that, but I think I have to say that again, in comparison to say something like the Arts Council through the chair, um, the Arts Council has been around for 65, nearly 70 years, I think now. The Heritage Council is, uh, you know, a whippersnapper still, and I think that in the 20 years since it was established, it has raised, and Joe and and, and uh, Shirley have touched on that, and and uh, Mary as well, the, the fight. They've raised the level of awareness. What is needed now in the context of a new strategic plan from the Heritage Council, a new national policy on heritage, that that is actually matched up and that the funds and the resources are there that allow that independence to be carried out. Because the department and all, all civilised states look after the things that the state owns whether it's their cultural institutions, and they're investing huge amounts in that now. They're beginning to answer that question. They look after the national parks, the things that the state owns. What we're talking about is investment in the rest, the communities that are out there, the places where people live. And, you know, that should be, at a political level, an easy sell. But it doesn't seem to be. I'm offering you a way for it to become it. Oh, yeah. sorry, from sorry, Chair. Sorry, I'm sorry, Chair. Uh, sorry, Chair. Sorry. I think uh, Shirley also wanted to respond, and then we, we will come back again if it needs to be. Um, thank you. It's a very interesting perspective. Um, just to say that um, I suppose we already were used to working in collaboration with others from a, from a local authority heritage officer perspective. So we're based in local authority, obviously, we're local authority employees. We're co-funded with the Heritage Council, so we work very strongly in that networked sense. And then we also work directly up, to, we, we obviously communicate with the local, Department of Local Government, but we are very strongly linked with the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Gaeltacht. And that collaboration works very well for us. Um, and I, I absolutely agree with you about the problems to do with um, the extinction of our very key wildlife species mm -hmm. and our biodiversity mm -hmm. and the ecosystem services that those species and habitat support, um, I think it's very important. And um, so in our collaborative way, we work with the National Parks and Wildlife, which are based in this department, the National Monument Service and the National Inventory for Architectural Heritage. So we try to link with all of those different departments and um, we obviously work very closely with the Heritage Council. And I think there's, um, I don't know so much about the departments, but it's very useful that the Heritage Council is an independent established body to promote this agenda which is a national agenda. Um, but on the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, I do think that that is a very key issue for us and we work very hard. We, can, we, we work with biodiversity issues and heritage issues together. A lot of our heritage plans are now combined, heritage and biodiversity. And I think that heritage has a key role to play in sustainable societies, whether that's reusing his heritage assets in historic buildings, which is retaining their resource value, or whether that's conserving wildlife habitats and helping communities to do that or um, promoting agri-environment schemes which are results-based and to try to help people have livelihoods in rural areas and we're very much trying to work in that sphere but we definitely require more resources to help us to do that particularly going forward so I agree with you with the need for more resources absolutely and thank you very much and no okay. word like that uh, Danny you yeah. first, first of all um, I'm, uh, I'm delighted uh, to welcome you here today um, because uh, you play an important role, uh, such an important role in, um, in ensuring that we retain our identity because if we uh, don't, uh, we'll say, respect our heritage and our culture and support it, uh, uh, indeed, how are we to know how we came here or how we came to, to be here and it's so important to know how the people before us uh, survived and um, you know uh, how, how they actually lived and it's so important for us to, 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 to retain that because when we uh, talk about tourism uh, we need to protect as our, our national parks our, our heritage centres and all those things but uh, we need to protect uh, our identity as well as as a people and a race. And I mean, 
our music, our storytelling, our Irish dance, and all those things that that uh, people back over the generations, uh, you know, carried on before us and 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 brought us to where we are today. And uh, I suppose I just want to mention storytelling. Um, it's uh, it was a very uh, and should be still an important part of our uh, of, of our culture. And to that end, Frank Luce, I don't know if he uh, know the man down in Kerry, he arranged a, a very important gathering of storytellers there back about a month ago. It was attended by Professor Brendan O'Keefe and many others. And um, it's gatherings like that, uh, you know, we, we need to support those and to, uh, you know, ensure that that aspect of our culture is retained because yeah, anywhere you go today, you know, whatever gathering it is, everyone seems to be either this way or that way, and and um, yourself included. Well, I, I'm not as bad. I, I use the phone for phone calls, not for for anything else. But um, the people, and sure, look, it's modern technology, and they're getting to to see what's happening in other parts of the world. But I do believe that, uh, you know, when when we were young fellas, we, we, we were so anxious to hear what our father was saying or what our grandfather was saying or grandmother or whatever. No, I don't. I think that's something that that's not happening with the youngsters today. They have no interest whatsoever. Uh, we, we were so curious at that time, we, we, we found ourselves being told go way down there in the corner of oil and, and uh, you know, uh, if, if that was, we, we were in, into everything, we wanted to know what, what, what all the people were saying uh, and um, uh, I, th I believe we're, we're losing a bit of that now in, 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 in today's world and uh, again uh, our, our culture is our, our identity and um, I think people like Frank Luce now they, 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 and people that I'm sure there are other uh, places uh, and other people doing the same thing they need they actually need financial support and need uh, support from our heritage officers and I, I agree with the uh, uh, the, that uh, that service in local authorities should be expanded, and 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 we should have more people employed there. Um, we, I know our heritage officer T. J. Man is is a great person, and he's doing very good in Kerry. But he is is limited in what he can do because he's only he's only one man. He needs he needs he needs more help. And I suppose when you spoke about uh, houses, Michael, and um, you know how they can be, uh, I, how they can be improved, and and people can live live in them. I I I, I support you in what you're saying, but in other places, then we have problems where where you need a radiant barrier or whatever, and um, it's not financially possible to. To, to retain that building, or it's not how to say, it's not really feasible for someone to live in it without a red, a red and barrier. When when we know now that red and creates uh, problems uh, for you know can, health issues, cancer or whatever. And one place brings to mind that Castle Island, uh, we lost uh, maybe like three in one family very close together because of raid and so the things like that need to be overcome I don't know if the walls can be left stand or whatever uh, I, I, people tell us it's not possible to deal with it properly that you have to you know so maybe that people could be encouraged to build the same type of building again in a modern way so I, I it's I suppose it is by talking about things like that that we kind of uh, see see what can be done to overcome uh, those problems because they are problems and that's why maybe you, you can't understand why a house is standing there and no one uses it, it doesn't look so bad or whatever and it could be re reused but there are physical problems that need to be dealt with so we, we need to work together to, 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 to over, um, overcome uh, 
over, overcome those things. So again, I, 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 I welcome you here and thank you very much. Kurma uh, do you want to respond, yeah? if, I, if I could, I'd, I'd like to come, to come back uh, to, to uh, the Deputy uh, on the, the, the building side of things in a, in a minute or two, but the point you make about the storytelling and the connection and, and the, the young people, that is, that is really a fundamental one. And if, if I may, Chair, uh, Helene O'Keefe, uh, her background is in education, works with young people, and is, she's been driving our, our Heritage in Schools programme. And a huge part of that is is about uh, getting young people to connect the way that you just described. Could I in invite uh, Helene to say a few words, Chair? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, absolutely. The Heritage and Schools scheme, I suppose, in reference even to Deputy O'Reilly's question earlier, and um, increasing diversity and you know access to, to different uh, groups and new communities uh, to Heritage. The Heritage and Schools scheme allows for that also. But at the moment, we have a panel of 160 heritage experts, and those are experts in the realm of cultural heritage, uh, built heritage, and also natural heritage. So the schools will book from a directory of experts uh, an expert to visit their school, and they will come to the school and usually, where possible, bring the students outside, so to their local heritage site or to a local aspect of their own heritage, so they can see what's around them and appreciate that intrinsic connection between their own place and their own heritage. So that's a facility that really has been incredibly successful um, in terms of accessibility, in terms of diversity, just up to this point in the year um, because we offer a system whereby the Heritage Council will pay a percentage of the experts' costs for the day and the school will pay the other percentage. We offer a scheme for DESH schools or designated disadvantaged schools whereby the Heritage Council will pay a greater percentage, therefore allowing accessibility for those schools to these heritage experts, perhaps more than would otherwise have been the case. But 760 schools, se apologies, 796 um, dis designated disadvantaged schools this year have availed of that, that particular um, Heritage Council service. So it is allowing students to become more aware, more familiar, more appreciative of, of their local heritage and very much articulates Heritage Council uh, in terms of its statutory obligation to educate and to inform um, people about their heritage. So I suppose that's, that covers it really. Yeah. Just allow me, I think, I think uh, our heritage is very important for to sell our tourism product. And it's, uh, I see a difficulty, a difficulty now um, with our current, current uh, set up in, in rural areas where heretofore uh, visitors, you know, they came to small villages and usually the meeting place was uh, a pub and you had the local fellas and the, 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 the visitors enjoyed those, but most of the local pubs are closed now. So I see, um, I see that we're losing one of our selling points there because people really enjoyed the, you know, the old fellas singing the song or singing the local song or telling the local story or playing the local tune and people came from all over the world for that. So we're, 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 we're actually, we're, we're at the point of losing that completely you now because uh, with new rules and regulations and everything and, and rural, life, uh, rural people in decline, numbers in decline, we're losing that aspect and I don't know how that can be addressed. And, and I, I hear what you're saying, Helene, uh, about, uh, about, you know, it's available uh, now on the internet or whatever, or, you know, but that's a problem in, in, in the way that people abroad can actually get to know everything about us without coming to visit us at all. So in one way it's great and in another way it's, it's not. But I appreciate what you're doing in the schools as well and that's very important because it's going to be the only way that the youngsters are going to get to know what, what we were before and what the people before us did and, and, how, and how we got here. Take Senator Warfield, and if he's want to come back on that last point when he's finished as well. Come all of the witnesses to the committee. I would add that we will be judged on uh, what we uh, choose to remember and how we choose to remember it. And uh, nothing horrific has been mentioned in, in what we choose to remember in industrial schools and nights and laundries and all of that. Uh, although it's uncomfortable, the uncomfortable stuff is uh, important too. I probably don't need to have to say it, but. Um, 
The unpromptable stuff have, hasn't really been mentioned. Um, I completely agree, Michael, with your comments regarding heritage. Um, and I think Irish people take great pride in it, and I think that's evident in the 66 uh, monuments in Meath over the summer that were found. There was just a general, uh, kind of generous warmth online in response to it from from all quarters. Um, and before I go on, can I also extend solidarity to the uh, archaeologists who are on strike uh, at the moment? It's probably not uh, a question for uh, our witnesses here, but just to extend solidarity to them, um, and that none of uh, this would be possible without them. Um, I'm interested in the strategic objectives in, um, in advancing national policy and engaging with policymakers to do so. Um, if there are legislative priorities that the Heritage Council have, I would love to hear them before we conclude today. Um, priorities over the years to come, or amendments or specific pieces of legislation that you see uh, should be uh, worked on. Um, Another uh, priority, in my view, should be the, uh, the, need, the need for a national storage facility for our cultural institutions. Uh, when when uh, artefacts are found or donated, um, it's unfortunate that so much is not on display. Um, but I know our national museums, our national museum, uh, has a major difficulty in keeping artefacts within their limited space, and we've seen that across the library, I think, on a, on a visit to this committee. Um, in terms of the budget, uh, we were treated to an array of announcements by the Minister for Culture in Budget Week. All of the big ones listed, the Arts Council, Screen Ireland, uh, Culture Ireland was left to the end of the week because it was, uh, wasn't uh, a great an increase as the others. Um, we were never informed by the Department of the increase to the Heritage Council because there was no uh, press conference after the budget by the Department. Um, what was the increase? <laughs> there was a specific uh, increase in allocation for heritage in schools uh, of €200,000. So no change for the Council overall? No. no. £200,000. That's down from... Ah. I know, screen time, where has he gone? <laughs> uh, it's essentially the same as last year. It's down from capital, seven, 7 million back when. Mm. Uh, in 2008, 7 million, 5 million in 2009, down to 1 million in 2016, uh, 1 million from 2012 until 2016, 2 million in 2007 and 2018. So there's no change, really. Quite right. And that's the capital. Okay. Well, there are questions for government to answer, Michael. So, um, surely the the Creative Ireland programme you mentioned. I was trying to remember the name of the uh, local culture teams, um, but you mentioned them. Um, are you confident that heritage is not being left behind by those culture teams in any in any not in any areas? Yeah. Um, um, and. What kind of disparity exists? We see a huge disparity in arts spend across the local authorities, um, which, um, which is a, which is an issue of, uh, you know, access. Um, it's undemocratic. Um, is there a huge disparity in the heritage spend across local authorities? Would you know off the top of your head? Um, I don't have those figures readily available, um, but it ranges in arts from one euro eighty-nine per head on arts to seventy-five euro per head in other local authorities. So um, I just wonder: is there a similar disparity in, in heritage spend across the um, the local authorities? And I would uh, support your um, call for a. Uh, Assistant Heritage Officer mm -hmm. across the, the local authorities. Something crossed my mind there recently about uh, um, it was um, where was it? Oh. Allowing people to uh, around metal detecting and allowing people to when we think about uh, it was just your your reference to kind of democratising heritage. Uh, I know in Britain people are. Uh, 
are allowed to, to use metal detectors. It's not the case here, is it? No. And is that right? Um, well, because it would, it would, when people use metal detectors, they disturb the archaeology and the, and the chronology of where they find objects often. So here in Ireland, you're not allowed to use metal detectors because you would disturb an archaeological site and then lose the context for the finds, which means that you've got an object in isolation without its context. Yeah, but but there's but there are a number of very good archaeological um, summer schools that have been run through the Heritage Council and Heritage Officer Programme, for example, in Meath, the Black Friary Summer School, and there's been quite a few set up recently through the Heritage Officer Programme to democratise archaeological practice, so to allow people to actually get involved with actual digs, and the Tea Lane one also in Kilkenny. So I think those are very good practices rather than allowing people just to go in with. Um, Will I take your other question? Or do you, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned um, the uncomfortable stuff needs to be mentioned, and um, I agree completely with you. The vial with the valiant always is part of our heritage, and if you forget the vial, then, and people often don't want to remember that, but it's very important to retain aspects of that going forward for our own stability, actually, because if you start to erode bits that we're not uncomfortable with, then you can create a kind of a false identity that's based on something else. But, um, for example, there are a lot of work houses in Ireland that have been, you know, retained and used and w while not losing that um, history from them. For example, there's a Carrickmore Cross Workhouse in Monaghan which still has the children's dormitory active um, in the very top floor, but the whole community use of the building is active in the ground floors, including a creche, actually. Um, so I think we very much need to do that. And those are issues that we do explore at a local level through talks that we would have, um, even through the various programmes that we would run um, in our particular counties, Donegal and Monaghan and Louth, and counties that would be uh, close to Northern Ireland we would have quite a lot of work um, looking at those kind of difficult issues and we, use, we, we explore those issues through heritage and local heritage sites and it's a very good democratising way to look at things rather than focusing on politics. Um, on the Creative Ireland and are we sure that heritage isn't being left behind? No, I wouldn't be said that we are sure that heritage isn't being left behind. We are trying to do our best on the cultural teams to make sure that it is not and I believe that the Chief Executive of the programme, um, Ms Bonatti, is keen to try to make sure that heritage comes to the fore and is, that we can work, we can use use art as a new way to um, explore heritage. And for example, there was a fantastic um, pollinator initiative down in Leash and Offaly, for example, and it was done as part of the All Island Pollinator Plan, which comes through the National Biodiversity Data Centre, and we have an award through the Tidy Towns to support that. But Creative Ireland supported a, a new composing element, and Ian Wilson from Belfast made an entire piece where he interviewed local communities on pollinators and what they were doing with bees and insects and created an entire saxophonist piece for it that was held then in emo court. It's absolutely amazing and that's the type of thing that we would like to see happen through Creative Ireland, that it is used to explore our heritage, natural and cultural, in a new way so that we can meet new audiences. Um, so, but I would be very um, keen to ensure that the heritage spend keeps up to par with these new programmes that are coming into place and that we don't forget the asset on which all these things are dependent and to make sure to fund that appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, very, very quickly to pick up on the number of the points that uh, the Senator has, has raised. Um, or senators have raised. You said we're very positive, and yes, we have to be positive because if we weren't, uh, didn't stay positive, we'd be negative, and we can't afford to be negative because if you don't stay positive, you don't actually make any progress, and you stand still, and people pass you by. So, everyone is positive. But there are issues, uh, and not least of which, and I've touched on it in the presentation, is the, the one of capacity and resources. Uh, the Heritage Council over the 20 years has, I think, shown what is possible within the sector through a new way of working with uh, and at community level. Uh, so the opportunity that needs to be taken now is to actually uh, get the state to invest fully in that as well as invest in what I talked about, the properties that it owns. So there is a real need to get that uh, investment. We looked uh, uh, for just in the region of two million this year, we got 200,000 and, and, and I know that we'll be working with the department over the course of the next years to try and address that again and uh, again, as I stay positive, I don't ever think that we could say that we don't stop trying to get uh, an increase in resources. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on behind the scene. Um, the legislative priorities, 
It's very, very relevant. Uh, currently, uh, the Heritage Council is working and, and uh, as an advisory body helping with uh, reviews of national parks legislation. There isn't any in Ireland, and that's a, a, a you know not a, a normal uh, situation in itself uh, in comparison to other European countries. Uh, there is a, the, the wildlife uh, legislation the minister is currently looking at as well, and that's a priority, uh, which. The, Council has been pushing for a number of years, and that needs to be uh, up, updated. Um, there's a, uh, it has been sitting for a long time, and I'm hopeful that it will ever come. There is a new National Monuments uh, consolidated piece of legislation that really needs to see the light of day as soon as, as soon as possible. But one of the things that the Heritage Council, and again I go back to the contemporary approaches and the different ways of uh, doing things, and Council feels that there is a need for, um, and has proposed uh, to, to uh, the Department uh, some, some years back, what, what I would refer to as an enabling and empowering legislation, uh, that that actually encourages and allows uh, communities to identify what it is that they want to do and then come with a programme and a plan that would be supported through uh, uh, strategic funding, as it were. Uh, we, it was coined in terms of the initial proposal as a, as a Landscape Ireland Act, because landscape was seen as embracing the whole of where people live and where they work and where they visit. So that, that proposal is still there. It's not something that over the course of the last three to four years Council has given priority to, but it is still still very, very valid. If I could, uh, uh, and, and uh, you mentioned the storage facilities for the Council of National for the Cultural Institutions. Of course, the Heritage Council isn't a collecting institution, but we are part of the, the, the family. And, and Mary, I know for many years, uh, fought that fight within the, the National Gallery context, uh, uh, so, uh, Chairman, if I may. I think your uh, comments were very well made, and you made quite a lot of them. Um, I think your reference to the Magdalen laundries and that aspect of our past is very important to make. Um, we need to identify things that have not been a happy part of our past. It took us a long time to identify the famine and all that went with it. That is now continually being uh, reviewed and revised and reinterpreted. And I think that that will come once identifying sites and marking things. I think that will come. And I think it's very important. There is already stories and poetry being written about it. But I think it's still very painful in people's memories. Also, when you mentioned uh, when the issue of the metal detectors came up, I was reminded of the recent find that was found in Donegal just, what, a few months ago, and that's just through farming, the traditional way of sourcing finds. That's actually the ideal way to source a find. And the great thing was that when that find was uh, found, discovered, that the, our colleagues from the National Museum travelled up literally overnight and it was on display the next day in Donegal County Museum. That's the way local communities need to work together, that it is shown in its own county before it then travels for research. The, I think it's fantastic that you made a visit to the National Library. I, I cannot but imagine that Dr Sandra Collins was thrilled about that. The, the National Library is one of those institutions that is long overdue attention. I was in just recently just looking at the changing facilities, how they're going to uh, provide a service to the public while they um, put so much of their material in store in order to improve their storage facilities, but even more so in order to improve their public-facing engaging facilities and what they have programmed. Uh, coming down the track is just fantastic. I think it's a very difficult thing when you have collections, how you manage them. The National Museum, which is in fact four sites, has huge collections to manage. The National Gallery took the decision during its refurbishment programme to keep everything on site, no matter what, as, as the best way to protect it. So there actually isn't any one perfect solution to this problem. Uh, Glasgow have formed a storage facility where they bring several of their museums, house their collections there, and it is accessible. But it costs a lot of money to set that up, and it costs a lot of money to maintain it and for the staff to make it available to the public. So I think 
uh, the, the, the institutions are working with the department, with OBW, with other bodies, to try and see how they can manage their collections better, particularly at a time when conservation itself is becoming more eco-friendly. There are new approaches to conservation that are rigorous, but it's not as rigorous as they were in the past. So I think the comments are well made, and in this arena, it's a very welcome um, subject to be discussing something like this. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, thanks, Claire. Look, and I would like to thank the um, uh, the representatives and the officials for coming in today for what's been a very interesting conversation. I'm just looking to put my phone off here. Oh, so, sorry, make sure it doesn't ring. Really. Um, and to say, look, first of all, um, to congratulate you on your work uh, as a starting point because it's absolutely crucial um, the role you play, both the Heritage Council um, and each the individual heritage officers that the heritage officers we would all deal with in our own uh, capacities in our counties um, on a very regular basis, particularly on Belt Heritage, but on a range of local and uh, around Heritage Week. But the, the council also does a very key role. We might engage uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with you, but I'm very acutely aware of that. And um, you know, I am struck that uh, Senator Reardon earlier touched on the fact that heritage can be seen as a negative, and I can see that, and I can see ways that in the last 20 years you, you really redressed that balance. I think the linkages between the heritage council, with agricultural schemes like Reps and now Gloss, has been really positive because farmers normally saw a heritage monument on their land as a negative. Uh, somebody was traipsing over their ground, there was a, a huge concern of being sued or, or, or that. And the fact that it could be part of one of the environmental schemes um, to be enhanced, I think, is a really positive role and, and the role you play in that um, is to be recognised. And also, you know, I, I'm a um, chairman of the directors, uh, or, or I'm a chairman of the Friends of a Thai Heritage Centre Museum in South Kildare. And the, the depth of heritage we have in a Thai is phenomenal. Um, predominantly because it's an unemployment black spot and we have a lot of challenges there. Heritage is blamed for a lot of things that unfairly. Um, and I find myself, if I'm a local radio speaking of the positives of heritage, I w it will be said to me afterwards, oh, but your heritage has held the town back, and it hasn't. But you try and show people the potential that Ireland's ancient east and Ireland's hidden gems, or hidden heartland, um, has to maybe open up people's mind to that. And I think in all those spaces, um, tourism in particular, can show what can be done, but to maybe touch on some of the points that were made earlier, I, I do think that what the Heritage Centre and Museum is doing in Atai is actually really interesting. On the points made about the Magdalens and that, I think part of the issue might be is just it's so it's so recent and it's so raw. So, um, but. There is no doubt having recognising in your place the heritage of your place is what will buy people in. I'm talking about people who aren't initially passionate about heritage and just have a passing interest. How you pull them in is linkages to their own area. And in a Thai heritage centre, the section uh, commemorating local people involved and who died in World War One has been hugely interesting. And that's how you get the linkages. And then people are saying, oh, they were a relation of mine, and they trace back their roots. And that's got them in the door. And then they learn about er Ernest Shackleton and the connections there, and they learn about the different elements uh, of the centre. Uh, similarly, there's an awful lot more we have to do, and you need a lot more support in what you're doing. I, I completely get that. That's coming across very clearly here. Um, to, to my mind, I look at the current plains that we have in, in South Kildare, huge potential. Um, it needs an overall heritage management plan, and I work very closely with Bridget O'Loughlin and, and the great people in Kildare County Council to try and develop that. There's numerous agencies involved, but uh, you know, there's sites like that. I'm struck by the fact that um, you said, Michael, that there isn't an overall, there isn't legislation for national parks. It, it was, it, it, that's something I'm, you might expand on for me, to see the car is not a national park, I would like if it was, but um, is there any, I, I know there's a way of getting, you can look to have a place designated, but in terms of its overall management, you might just come back to me on that. Uh, Shirley, and thanks very much for your presentation, in relation to heritage officers, can you just, uh, obviously you come in under the remit of the Heritage Council, but you're members of staff of the local authorities, and I'm, I'm conscious of your, uh, you pointing out the fact, like arts officers, that you uh, are under a different government department than the local authority itself. Are you suggesting that you'd be better if you were under the local authority structure completely? I wouldn't be as convinced that if you were directly answerable to the Department of Housing and Environment, and that very busy department has a lot there, there'd be a risk of you getting covered up. I'm very conscious of um, uh, Mary Louise's points um, in relation to um, a set of own uh, the department. At the end of the day, the Constitution says we can only have 15 senior ministers and departments, so unless you're going to cut one like 
children or agriculture or something like that or have a referendum we're not going to that's not going to change anytime soon and I do think there are linkages between culture and heritage we have to get the balance back right and it's yeah. quite evident in terms of funding we need to have a um, in the future we need an increased uh, focus on heritage to make sure that that balance is right but I'm not convinced that it needs to be necessarily set alone but you definitely need more support in what you're doing and uh, to Shirley to your point in relation to uh, the possibility of an assistant heritage officer role you say that that's a request you put into the Heritage Council um, I'm sure Michael would need more funds for that to happen so um, I presume you're not just saying that for Michael to press a button on it Michael is that something you need support obviously directly from the department for and because to my mind I do not know how the individual heritage officers manage the, the key roles that we play, uh, that heritage officers play in each of the counties, is engaging with local communities. And it, you've made it very clear, both Joseph and Shirley have outlined that to us. There's no point in somebody coming down from Dublin telling people this is your heritage and this is important. You need to help the, the local community to see what's important and let them develop it. That involves a lot of hand-holding. I'm very aware that there's some really good people who volunteer and have their time and whether they're applying for built heritage schemes um, or you know, the, the development of county heritage plans, there's an awful lot of work there and to think that that's down on one person is just, it's not practical. Um, and I'd like you to expand and say what support do you need to be able to get that assistant heritage officer role because it's really important. And we just outlined to me the role of the conservation officer in a county council. Is that anyway linked or is that just a, a planning authority role and do they come in under the Department of Local Government? Um, because just so I fully am clear on how that works, but this is something I think as a committee we should take on to try and push for because, um, as I say, the, the work heritage officers do in enabling local communities is, is to make sure that uh, there's local ownership and buy-in of community um, uh, initiatives is, is absolutely the uh, key on that one and um, then just are you happy with the, um, the for the plans in, in, in terms of it, in, in re resources it, 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 do you just feel you need more resources to implement the heritage plans that exist or do we need more plans it, you know or do the plans need beefing up are you happy enough that we have the structure we just the, where do you feel the resources if and when we get additional resources where best um, can, can they be uh, spent and directed Thanks, Chair. Margaret, will we'll start? Uh, well, do you want to add, Chairman, what, for you? Uh, my, the, my, my okay, well, I, I okay, can start. Chairman. There's yes, no problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you're my good. Um, um, okay, first of all, no, I'm not suggesting that we should be under the other department. I think I'm just raising it as a, possibility, a possible reason why um, the section hasn't been expanded in recent years because they were not so obvious when the Department of Local Government are getting their returns or getting their indicators, you know, for different sections from within local authorities that they have sufficient indicators in and around heritage services so that they're, they're checking on those and so that we're not actually really noticed. Um, I think from the resources point of view, the, the, the assistant heritage officer programme that I mentioned, certainly I'm mentioning it because we did absolutely raise it with the Heritage Council Board and obviously the Heritage Council with the no increase, effective increase really in their budget, they would need an increase in their budget to provide that support to us and to the local authorities. And I think that that model has worked very well and I would be to say that that's the way that model should continue. On the conservation officers, um, conservation officers for people who don't know work within local authorities and they work specifically with um, protected structures, so structures that are protected under the Planning and Development Act so formerly known as listed buildings. So these would be structures from 1700 onwards. Um, they primarily work within the planning sphere, so they're dealing with exempted developments, Section 57 declarations, that type of thing, and don't really engage with communities um, in the same way we do. They primarily work within planning, although there would be some overlap. Um, but it's a different role entirely. It's not community focused. It's, building on, it's focused on the building itself, I would, I would say. Um, there was another question I thought was relevant was there or was that did I cover them all you mentioned a lot of things there uh, um, uh, what was the other question yeah no change of role or just the overall heritage plans do you think are our plans robust enough do we need I think I think it's just resources to implement it's resources and it's personnel really that we need it's technical expertise at a local level we can't you know we cannot spend more more money on heritage without having people to be able to facilitate and enable local communities to do that work it needs a resource of people there so it needs both yeah. okay 
Chairman, yes, um, again, a number of points, and I hope that I, I'll, I'll cover all of them. Um, the National Parks legislation, effectively in, in an Irish context, uh, and in, still in some European countries, uh, the National Park owns on a model, uh, works on a model where um, the state owns the land and they, they decide it's a, nas a national park. Uh, and that would be, uh, shall we say, less contemporary than most European countries now, which have. Uh, dedicated national park legislation which is based not only on nature conservation but on socio-economic and rural development needs as well. Uh, so there's there's a need for uh, that to be looked at in the context of you know, the, the upland areas and our national parks do a fantastic job but they again are very restricted in terms of A, the location and, and B, the resources that, that, that are put, to put their way. There has been a, a modest increase I understand in their allocation this year but again the legislation needs to be there for uh, the legislators to really buy in and see the value of it and I, certainly I welcome the fact that the, the department is looking at that at the moment. I have to say I have a, a particular interest in that uh, because my own background was in, in uh, national parks, regional parks within uh, the UK and within France and I've sort of made a bit of an art of, of looking at models and the ways in which uh, countries cope with this type of uh, situation. One of the issues of course in an Irish context was the resistance to the use of the term national for anything that actually uh, was considered to be privately owned. So that's, a, that's an obstacle that needs to be overcome. But believe you me, every other European country has overcome it and has very good and very targeted legislation. The, the French uh, regional parks and their national parks, they are now focused on socio-economic development. That's their, their ultimate purpose and, it is, and it's a shame that uh, Deputy Healy Ray isn't here at the moment because it is really targeting rural depopulation and the decline in rural areas. So there is a, there's an, there's, there's a job of work that could be done and heritage can play its part. Um, in terms of the uh, the need for capacity, uh, really, you said, are we happy? No, never happy with with the, the resources. And I think it's important to realise that. Uh, I, I will check the figures, but I think that in terms of our budget allocation at the moment, we're around about 2006, 2007 levels. The Heritage Council, and I have to say, did take a 65% cut in its allocation, and it has never recovered that. Uh, again, within the context of our new strategic plan, within the uh, working arrangements with the department at the moment, I would hope that over the course of the lifetime of this plan, that that gets, that gets addressed. So where do the resources go? I think it's important to say that during that time of cuts, the community-led sector in Heritage exemplified by the heritage, they all knuckled down, they took the bad news, as did we all, they survived, they, they upped their ante, uh, they, they did more for less, but you can only do that for so long. Uh, you know, there is, a, there is a, a point where that piece of elastic can be stretched and, uh, and, and it breaks. Uh, there needs to be now some acknowledgement and recognition and not taking of granted of the community-led voluntary sector and we need to make sure that the resources and the capacity are provided to allow that to happen. I hope that comes through the Heritage Council as this plan is implemented. Also this council again and uh, represented by Mary Burke has a number of new initiatives and new ideas and they want not only to sort of build on what has happened over the last 20 years but make sure that we address these contemporary issues and I did touch on climate change and it's very clear the role that heritage can play in that uh, and it may sound as though it's uh, um, a far stretch but uh, again I appreciate in the absence of the, the deputy now he touched on the value of uh, heritage led regeneration to help overcome some of the housing crisis. It doesn't solve it but it can play its part properly resourced. Um, I, I have to say that our work has always tried to support the local level delivery of a service. And we are a public service, and that's what we're focused on. So the, the concept, and I've welcomed the, the, the positive response from all of the members here, 
to the uh, way in which local authorities, uh, they, their service at that level could be bolstered. Um, I think that that's something that the Heritage Council has listened to the, uh, the, the, the heritage officers, but they know themselves as well that given the capacity and securing the resources, they'll be only too pleased to actually achieve that. Thank you. I have one or two questions on my own, so um, I think Joseph wants to come in there on the last question. So yeah, maybe just in relation to Deputy Hayden's um, question there, I do think tremendous uh, potential does exist at uh, the local level, and again, I think increasing capacity of the local authority to work with those communities and to support them and to give them the advice and direction is very, very important. If we take the example, for, ex um, for instance, of the conservation of traditional buildings, um, and again, the, the glass scheme that you mentioned, um, exemplified, I suppose, through the traditional farm buildings grant scheme that the Heritage Council operates, you know, that allows to increase the capacity at local level to conserve a very important aspect of our built heritage. But as well as that, it develops traditional building skills. And again, back in 2009, there was an All-Ireland Report on Traditional Building Skills, which identified that there was a, a very much a need for training and for capacity building in that area. And 10 years on, there's still that need in order to, for investment in those uh, skills development. And that skills development provides employment opportunities, and again we see it in Donegal with our traditional uh, building stock there and the work that's being done, employment for Thatchers, traditional craftsmen, uh, those who uh, build uh, sash windows and repair sash windows and so on. Um, but it, it's all about enhancing the local communities as well that people live in. And they want to retain that aspect of their heritage because they're very proud, quite rightly, of that and they want to promote that. And indeed, visitors to our island want to see those aspects of our built heritage there. So I think those types of programmes, with all those different types of wins at local level, uh, for locals, for visitors to the area, for the skills sector, for employment. I think that's all very, very positive. And one of the things that we've done in Donegal every couple of years is that we run vernacular architecture seminars for the owners or occupiers of these traditional buildings to encourage them to conserve them. And every time we run it, we are always oversubscribed between 120 and 140 people on, on a Saturday morning. And they come along to hear sort of different experts talking about sort of how they can conserve their buildings make them livable, uh, bring them back into use. And then in the afternoon we have traditional craftsmen uh, showing the, the practice of traditional skills. And these are skills that are very much accessible to the local community. You don't need necessarily to have experts there. You need just a little bit of direction and some of that work can be done by the owners or occupiers themselves. And again, I think as we all know, the best way to conserve a building is to actually keep it in use. Well, Margaret, you know, as I said, I have a, I have a number of questions. Um, like I, I, I represent an, an area which is, in many ways, spoiled for choice, Dublin South Central, which has Kilmaine in it and in, in Chicor and kind of quite, quite a number of buildings from in terms of built heritage in particular, but there's also, you have the canals and the Liffey and all that, so um, a, lot, a lot of my time has been spent in, in the area encouraging and very little encouragement needed are working with uh, different aspects uh, of local communities in terms of uh, the, the, the trying to enhance the, the heritage or uh, it's it maybe a bad word, exploit the heritage for the community that lives in it, but also to put it on show for people who are coming in to look at it. Um, uh, and and we, we've been quite successful uh, just in recent times. We managed to get the local authority to, to, to buy an old mill, which NAMA was holding kind of from us, Kilmainham Mill, and kind of now the, the plan is what do you do with it? Uh, and there is a plan there, and kind of the, 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 the has been over the years. But it's great when you have a success like that because we've lost so much over over the years, um, and kind of it, it, it allowed the community to, um, to do something which you were saying um, about going into the school. So kind of two two of the representatives learnt. If, if learnt was the word, I think they had a lot more than most of us on the committee, uh, an understanding of how the, the mill was used, and they now go into schools and start to present to the local schools, who, because the mill was in operation right up until the 1980s. 
and so there's footage of it in operation to, um, and so people remember my grandfather or whatever and all of a sudden it's stored and I think kind of once you store people whether it's history heritage or whatever way you want to describe it kind of the, it, it, it's so vast um, uh, and I think uh, a lot of young people in particular it's it's a spark, kind of switches them off from the gadgets in some ways, <laughs> and they look at their own areas in a different way. The, there was an interesting point that made there, and we will be dealing with the museums in, in, in the near future. Um, new technology can be used as a, an advantage, and especially with storage. The, my father worked in a museum for many, many years, and the scary stories he told me about storage, um, and to my knowledge, some of it still happens. In this day and age, kind of everything should be catalogued and put available online. Whether it's in a box forevermore, I don't mind. The idea is that it's accessible somehow or other to the public. We can't put everything on display, but that they know we have it, we have it protected for them, um, and that it's available. Um, but the the the. the the question I have is, it, it, kind of there's, there's two very specific, and they're not my my area of expertise, so I might be wrong in it. Board of Moment just announced the ending of um, the peat fired and the cutting off turf in huge, vast areas of Ireland, um, and I think I don't know whether you have given some thought to it. Is what will we do with the heritage? And how do we, or is this an opportunity for us as a, a, a society to, um, if you want to reintegrate some of the species, some of the, the what, what was before, and how, how do we interact with that? And maybe uh, the, the, the minister might tell us at some stage, you know, that, and, and invite submissions. Um, just because it's so vast. And uh, it, is, it, it gives us an opportunity to do, I think, as a society, a lot of stuff that maybe we didn't have money for or we didn't have the vision for in, in the past. And second of all, it's just something, and Deputy Healy Ray is uh, gone, I thought he might have raised it. Um, how do we protect some of our heritage sites in particular from rhododendron? Japanese knotweed and the likes, and I saw in the paper only last week, I think it was the men's sheds had gone down to Killarney to get stuck in and kind of well done to them. The, the little knowledge I have of rhododendrons and, uh, is I think they need to be on site every single weekend for the next 10 years and if just to undo some of the damage and to kind of resurrect the parts of the national parks that you were mentioned. Um, and kind of I know my own area, Japanese knotweed has held up a social housing project for a year just because of the how, how to treat it, um, and so it, it is something that not just affects our heritage sites, but it affects our uh, future, future sites as well. Um, and just just to say thank you very much, kind of for quite an, an enlightening in some ways uh, presentations from from everyone here and. and what I've done is I've taken my own scribbled notes um, because there are a number of points I think if the Minister comes before us again soon that we can raise directly with them or we might kind of specifically uh, write to the department to see whether they are going to give consideration in particular for the assistant heritage officers. Um, if nothing else, if we can achieve that over the next year, I think we'll have done a lot to kind of uh, help, help the Heritage Council but help ourselves in particular and, and the local authorities also who in my own area have done tremendous work and I've worked with them on saving too, too many buildings at this stage. <laughs> some people say that that's all I'm tied up with, um, but some of them are absolutely fine. Oh, sorry, uh, there was one one project that happened uh, in Kilmainham, uh, in Chicor area, is prior to the Richmond Barracks being uh, saved or r restored. Um, the local authority came with the, the library service and they put a call out to the local community to do an audit of material. And I hadn't seen it before. And literally, they had the hall, and anybody came with any bit of history, is what they were told, family or whatever, and they were scanned in, photographed, and logged. So the library service 
now has a log of a lot of material which isn't held in a museum. They know where it is, they know what it's about, and they have inter interacted with them since. And I don't know whether that's something... It, it was a big job of work, but, and it was on a Saturday, and I didn't... I, like I said, I've seen more weapons on that day than I've seen all my life. <laughs> um, and it was just interesting, uh, because it was a barracks. So, kind of, and what it was is that people brought kind of old memorabilia from British soldiers' days when they were there, from when the, the, the National Forces took over the barracks uh, in 22, and then kind of other bits and pieces that uh, so, so, soldiers who had been abroad or people who were working in CIE works who had created for others, and just general history. Um, and one of the things that's in the barracks is the, the roll books of the school that was set up in 24. So every single day, kind of now there's data protections up because some characters are alive and there's little notes about them, so we have to be careful. But they're on show, kind of a roll book, kind of, and that, you think of the social history of that, and kind of, again, the museum is very small there, but it, it, it does some, some, something which I, I, I think I'm proud of, kind of, we wanted to do a lot more, but it's only a small building. So I, I'll leave it at that, and again, thank you. May I make just one small comment um, that, for, from our perspective, it's a very welcome thing for us to be here to listen to you, all of your comments and for us to be able to present and give our answers, particularly in relation to the Heritage Council's new plan, its new strategy, which is being launched this year, which is 2018, the Year of Cultural Heritage, and it will conclude in 2022, which is towards the end of the decade of centenaries, we kind of have a sense within the Council that it's maybe happening at a historic time, that it could be a very good time for heritage, that it could be a, a good time to improve the structure and the funding of the, um, the Council. Um, <clears throat> I think you're, 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 you've ranged over so much there that it's, it's, it's all to do with local communities. And the fact of being able to present here means, to a degree, that you're actually advocates for heritage. You're actually advocates for heritage. So, from our perspective, if you can um, fight our cause, that would be hugely helpful for us. Mm -hmm. Because heritage is Ireland's greatest natural national asset. You know, it really is. So it's a privilege, really, to be here. Thank you. Michael. Yeah, Chair, yes, just to pick up on the very, sp and thank Mary for, for the, those those words which I echo strongly. We really need all the, the support we can get, uh, and certainly uh, the Heritage Council would be very happy to administer any funding that was targeted towards the um, uh, Assistant Heritage Officer programme. If we could kick that start uh, over the next 12 to 18 months, that would be a wonderful, wonderful achievement. Board of Mona, um, Yes, uh, there's there's a real there's a real job of work to be done. But again, it's a tremendous opportunity, and I have to say I know the area very well because the very first chairperson of the Heritage Council, Frieda Rowntree, was from uh, Five Valley, Blue Ball, just outside Tullamore. So I spent a lot of time uh, up and down uh, that that road, and she introduced me to the delights of uh, uh, the, the the bogs of Ireland. To be honest with you. Um, they have done tremendous work, Board de Mona. They've shown again what is possible. Uh, Bura Parklands, for example, if you have not visited Bura Parklands, then I strongly recommend that you do. There is the potential to extend that, to make it, uh, if you like, not only a, a nature conservation haven, but a, a recreational site for people to visit and improve their well-being. They've built in cycle tracks. They have done a lot. Again. They can only do so much, and this is where, in some ways, the, I go back to the question about legislation, because if there was a framework with empowering and enabling legislation that enjoyed, uh, allowed local authorities and communities to identify what it was needed for their area, and then that area was designated as uh, something uh, such as a, a, a regional park or something along those lines, as happens in the rest of Europe, then there would be a, a legislative framework in which they could this, this issue of, of uh, Board of Mona could be addressed. There's an opportunity there, and the Heritage Council, I hope, will, will help. Um, the Heritage Officers have been very active in terms of the invasive species. You talk about the rhododendron and the Japanese knotweed. 
Uh, and of course, there is very good science now uh, through the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Uh, the National Biodiversity Data Centre um, is, in fact, the, the hub now through which all of the invasive species, whether it's rhododendron or Japanese knotweed, uh, and not, knotweed are actually ac accessed the spread of it. What you can do about it, it's very, very difficult. They are invasive species and the solutions are not easy, but... Uh, uh, there are issues, issues are happening. Sorry, I was just saying there were some around here. There's some invasive species around here too. I see, I see. Right. Stay, stay calm. And Chairman, I, I appreciate that the, the uh, committee is coming to a, a, its end. And, and uh, if you'll indulge me in, in 30 seconds, um, I, I will be stepping down as Chief Executive of the Heritage Council at the start of the, the new year. And I just want to put on record. Uh, my appreciation for the, the consideration that has been given to the Heritage Council and its uh, work over the years that I've been as Chief Executive, but above all for the, the thought-provoking discussions that have uh, taken place and the courtesy that the, the consecutive chairman and members have shown to me during my time as Chief Executive. So my thanks to you on a personal basis. On behalf of the Heritage Council, Mary might like to uh, uh, add again what she just said. Uh, it's really very, very important for us. Well, just that we're, we're thrilled to have been invited and to have had the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I wasn't sure whether we were going to have the opportunity to mention the fact that um, our esteemed uh, Chief Executive Officer will be stepping down at the beginning of January, but I'm very glad that it has been made because um, it is his legacy that will carry the Heritage Council through to its next phase, and it's a moment to pay uh, due regard and due respect to that legacy. Um, just to end on one point, um, the uh, Heritage uh, 2030 is the new Department of Arts Heritage Plan and it works very closely, uh, complements the Heritage Council's plan. One of the things that they have just initiated is uh, an open public consultation. So it's a very good time to alert people in your own area to be vigilant to that consultation. Um, they're very keen to involve as many people as possible in expressing their views and their opinions about what can be done for Irish heritage. So it's, it's a really good way to get everybody to articulate their thoughts. So I, I don't know if they've organised exactly where and when, but I think it would be worth watching uh, the website to see where and when they organise these public consultations and to be there and to encourage your colleagues to express their views on something like uh, the um, Bordnemona site, which definitely should be marked by some very um, uh, creative, innovative um, centre or whatever they conceive the appropriate thing to be. So huge thanks to Michael for his work. His legacy is what has shaped and will shape the council into the future and we're, it's only fair to say we will be welcoming the new chief executive officer next year when we know who that person is. Can I, can I just say, we didn't go for the vote because we cancelled each other out. I would have been voting um, against the government and you would have been voting, Sinn Féin would have been voting for. Um, can I just say that when I mentioned about you having a separate department, I didn't, I, I meant it in a more ethereal sense that, that you would have more, more money, more power, more decision. I understand it can only be 15 departments. I understand your link with arts, heritage, the I, and but it's very important that you have the power and that you have your own uh, within the council, within the heritage council, and the money, you know, and more money and more officers. It was more that, and that you weren't vying all the time, you know, in a, in some kind of an order. So if we can do anything through the legislation. Not me. Um, to, to help you in your legislation, in commencing some legislation, or in your officers, we, we certainly shall. And you know, just want to make that clear. Sorry, I'm just going to wrap up, and I think on behalf of the committee in particular, a huge thank you, and maybe the people of Ireland as such, to to Michael for his stewardship. Um, kind of, you have big boots to, to fill. Uh, whoever's coming in, I doubt it's the last we have seen of you in public life. Kind of, but we'll we, we'll see. Uh, I want to thank 
each and every one of you for the presentations and for taking our questions and answering them quite, quite openly and hopefully uh, we'll be coming back to this issue on an ongoing basis but with uh, progress and that's, that's the key one and as, uh, as I've committed I think the members will uh, share this is that kind of we will raise these issues with, with the Minister and with the department officials as they come before us um, and if, if you feel and if you, you think you've missed out on any point feel free to send us a, a, a note on it and then we'll share it with all, the, all, all of the members. So again I, I want to thank you and I want to bring this matter to a conclusion now and I will suspend for a few minutes just to, to and then we'll go into a private session. Okay, I think.